9-11. Usually we call 9-11 when we need help. We're doing a series on the restoration or the rebuilding of the Tabernacle of David, and it's around Amos 9-11. On that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. you got to check out this series. We'll be doing that for the next number of weeks. God bless. How many of you are glad to be here today? Yes. It's good to have you here. It is good that we gather in the house of the Lord to lift up and exalt Jesus as that song says that we were singing, it, it was actually around, or it is from a uh, passage of scripture that says that he inhabits the praises of his children, of his people. And as we begin to praise the Lord, there's an inhabitation of, of the presence of God in our, our midst. This morning, the Lord was here even at the altar as there was ministry done at the altar. We can come in directly into the presence of God, according to Hebrews 10, from verse 19 to 25. In fact, the Lord is desiring for us to come into his presence because we can as we go through Jesus Christ. I want you to listen very carefully this morning. And we've been talking about rebuilding the tabernacle of David. David lived about 3,000 years ago, about 1,000 B.C. David lived. This was after Moses and the children being of, of God being taken out of slavery. Um, they had been in Egypt for 400 years. And uh, so they initially had gone down a small family of Abraham. There was 75 uh, or so of the family and the, uh, of his offspring, uh, sorry, of, of Jacob. So Jacob had gone and uh, there was uh, plentiful that came because of Joseph. And then after Joseph died and there were pharaohs that, that didn't know or remember, they enslaved the children of Israel. And, and it was amazing over the course of hundreds of years, you have 75 individuals becoming several million there's probably two to three million people that, that were offspring of those 75 over the course of the, the hundreds of years that they were in Egypt. And the final part was that they were in slavery. They came out of Egypt powerfully, and the Lord gave instruction for a tabernacle. A tabernacle is a, is a, a building, and this tabernacle could be moved, and there was opportunity for them to come into the presence of God, but that direct presence of God, they could only come in, or one man would come in once a year into the Holy of Holies. And there was the Ark of the Covenant, a chest that was covered with gold, and uh, inside the chest were the, the Ten Commandments. There was manna, the bread that they had ate while they wandered, in the wilderness for 40 years, and they were taken care of miraculously by God every day fed. And so there was a jar of this manna, which was a, a pastry, if you would, that they, they ate every day. Uh, later on, they had quail. They had meat as well. They complained. They said, ah, we want something other than manna. We want... So they, they, they were uh, uh, struggling, even with God helping them out. You cannot survive. How can three million people survive in in the wilderness and yet God took care of them even with their grumbling but there was this tabernacle that could move and it moved about 30 times or just over 30 times during the course of the 40 years in the daytime there was a cloud that 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 covered so that they weren't hot in the, the wilderness and the heat and at nighttime, when it would get really cold, there was a pillar of fire that, that kept them warm. This lasted for 40 years. Miraculous presence of God, but to come directly into that presence, one man on the Day of Atonement, uh, which is still 
to this day, it is recognized. They can't, they don't, there is no temple now. There is no way for people of Jewish uh, uh, custom uh, to, to come into temple because there is no temple. The temple was destroyed in AD 70. So there was a temple built. The first one was built in the, just after David by King Solomon. And again, there was this holy of holies this room inside the temple. So it was no longer a tabernacle that could be moved. It was an actual building that took seven years to build. 130,000 laborers, seven years. There was over 3,000, uh, what should I say, uh, overseers that were overseeing this project. And when it was assembled, there was not a single sound of a hammer or anything cutting or whatever, everything was done outside of where the ta tabernacle or the temple would be set up. And ta uh, Solomon's temple was beautiful and it was destroyed completely in, in 586 BC by the Roman uh, Empire by King Nebuchadnezzar. Every single stone taken down. It was rebuilt. And it took a long time to rebuild because the people were struggling with the rebuilding of this temple. And it took a number of years to rebuild that sec second temple, which was in existence. And, and uh, it, was, it was called Herod's temple at that time because Herod had added to, or, or put things uh, attached to it or whatever. Uh, but there was that same temple then, the second temple, that was built. And again, all to say there was only one man in, that could come into the presence of God directly. And that was the high priest on the Day of Atonement one day out of the year. The tabernacle of David was unique in that the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the Holy of Holies, was open because there was no other room. There was nothing else around it. It was covered with a, a, a canopy, and the Ark of the Covenant was underneath. So people could come in to the presence of God. In Acts chapter 15, it talks about the rebuilding of the temple of God. In fact, we are able to come into the presence of God, and there is still only one way that we can come in. Last week, if you missed the message the last few weeks, check it out. It's, it's important. In fact, if you haven't been listening to or have missed uh, this uh, series on rebuilding the tabernacle of David, check it out. And uh, so Lighthouse Niagara, a little plug again, Lighthouse Niagara uh, on the website, uh, or Lighthouse Niagara on YouTube or Rumble. Uh, check it out. We are on our fifth part of this series. And uh, last time, and I'm, I'm going to jump a little bit here. I just, I want to say this. We've been going around First Chronicles chapter 16 in the Old Testament. You say, Pastor, Old Testament. We're not in the Old Testament any, anymore. I'll tell you. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. And there, there are things that were given to us in the Old Testament. The truth of it is for us today. And so, so many of us, at times, we, we struggle with the things of life that we say, God, where are you? Man, do I need you now? And we come. And we, we cry out, God, you've got to give me answers and it's like, God, where are you? Last time, we talked about a place called Gibeon. And I checked out Gibeon. It is a perfect place. It's, Gibeon is, it, the word Gibeon for that, that, that town, it means hill city. And so you can check it, Google it. Gibeon is this raised mound, and it's perfect. There was the tabernacle of Moses 
was there on that hill. So it's, that tabernacle would have been hundreds of years old already. And it was on that hill. And what we found out about last time was that the Ark of the Covenant that David had brought in already was in the city of Jerusalem. And you might say, how far is Gibeon from Jerusalem? It's about five miles away or eight kilometers away from Jerusalem. Now, here's the unique thing about God showing up for, for Solomon. So Solomon was the, the offspring of David and would succeed David in ruling the uh, nation of Israel. God loved David. David was a man of war. And he said, David, you have spilled blood. You have spilled blood. I don't, you will not be building a t uh, the temple. Your son will build the temple. But David already, it was in his heart. It was in his heart. I want that the temple of God is built. And one of the things that, that are said of David and, and Solomon said, and this is a statement of the Lord, because the temple was in your heart, this is a good thing. It is good that the temple, that you wanted to have the temple built, it was in your heart. And I want to say today, the temple of the Lord needs to be in our heart. We are the temple of the Lord, it says in 1 Corinthians. It talks about the fact that we are the temple of the Lord. And so often, we have opportunity for the presence of God. The moment we give our life to Jesus, the moment we say, Lord, there's sin in my life, and I, I confess my sin, and I repent of my sin, and I come to you. You are the only one that can forgive me of my sins. And there is a change that takes place as we place our faith in the one that took our sins upon himself. Because we can't save ourselves. I always use the illustration just like this. I'm in quicksand and I'm trying to pull myself out. You can't do it. We need to have help and the Lord Jesus is there to help us. Our sins, every single one of our sins, past, present, future, were put on him. That doesn't mean, that, hey, I have a license to sin. Uh, it's been taken care of. Paul writes in Romans 6, he says, God forbid. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. But God forbid that we just say, well, oh, I've been forgiven, so I'll continue on in sin. God forbid that we do that. So there's this place, interestingly enough. So the, the presence of God is, represented in this Ark of this Covenant, this chest, like it could be carried. It was carried by the, the priesthood on their shoulders when it was moved. So it could be carried easily. But it's interesting. When Solomon went and was blessed, he was blessed tremendously because he went to the altar. He didn't go to the, where the Ark of the Covenant was. He went to Gibeon where the tabernacle was and there was something there at the, at the opening of the, of the tabernacle that had been built and fashioned hundreds of years earlier by a man anointed of the Lord to help him to fashion this thing. And it was still in existence, this altar And what he did, and this is significant, what he did, Solomon, when he began his reign over Israel, the first thing that he did is he went to this, to this place, and there were the entire assembly was with him. So there are potentially, and if you look at Gibeon, this place, it's, it's a raised mound. I don't know how many hundreds of feet high it is, Several hundred feet high. I don't know. I, I was trying to find the elevation of, of Gibeon. But I could see easily that you could fit 300 or 3 million people around the assembly around that hill. And on top was a tabernacle. And 
at the opening of the tabernacle was the altar. It was the altar. And that day, he sacrificed 1,000 sacrifices on the altar. And God showed up. I want to read this. Second Chronicles 1, 1 to 13. Now Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom. And the Lord his God was with him and exalted him exceedingly. And Solomon spoke to all Israel, to the captains of the thousands and of the hundreds, to the judges and to every leader in, in Israel and the heads of the house, houses, the father's houses. Then Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon. For the tabernacle of meeting with God was there which Moses, the servant of the Lord, made in the wilderness. But David had brought up the ark of God from kerjath Jerum to the place David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it at Jerusalem. So the ark of the covenant, as I said, was in Jerusalem, and there was a tent for it, but the altar. It says, now the bronze altar that Be Bezel Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, had made, he put before the tabernacle of the Lord, and Solomon and the assembly sought him there at the altar, which was in, at, at Gibeon. And S Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. And that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask, ask, what shall I give you? What do you want from me? And Solomon said to God, You have shown great mercy to David my father and have made me king in his place. Now, O Lord God, let your promise to David my father be established, for you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can judge this great people of yours? It were probably, I don't know. Actually, it would have been way more than three million at that point. Millions, probably, possibly, just as many Jews that are living in Israel right now. The population of Israel with those that are Arabs. Do you know that there's 1.6 million Arabs that live in Israel and they're, they're totally fine, not having issue like they have with Gaza? They live, 1.6 million Arabs live in Israel, and they're perfectly fine. There's about 8.1 or 2 million that live in Israel right now as our population. I want you to know there was a huge number. They offered 1,000 burnt offerings on the altar and God shows up and he says now O Lord let your promise to David my father be established for you have made a, me king over people like the dust of the earth in multitude now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people for who can judge this great people of yours then God said to Solomon because this was in your heart and you have not asked for riches we'd say hey give me more money I, want, I just need money I need more money or wealth or I need honor. I want to be elevated. I want to have position. Or the life of your enemies. Hey, God, take care of all my enemies. Nor have you asked for long life. God, give me a great life. But have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. I'm going to give you wisdom and knowledge. And I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have like. So things that you didn't ask for, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you some of the, uh, these other things. So Solomon came to Jerusalem from the high place that was at Gibeon, from before the tabernacle of meeting, and reigned over Israel. Listen, blessing, life, abundance flows from the altar of sacrifice. The altar. The altar back then is pointing to one thing. The altar now. The, the place of sacrifice. 
the altar back then, the sacrifices were all pointing to the one sacrifice that would take care of everything, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, you're saying, how can I have these things in my life today? You say, that's Old Testament. What about today? I mentioned the things about worry. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, from, uh, first, from verse 25. And I'm going to be reading from three or four different passages mainly. Matthew 6, Romans 3, Isaiah 64, and 1 John 5, if I get there. Therefore I say to you, and I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to get there. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. That's what we worry about. Lord, I need to have enough food to eat. I don't know if I have enough food to eat. I don't even have enough to drink. My body. I don't have clothing. How am I going to keep warm in the, in the winter time? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit <coughs> to his stature? Anybody grow? Anybody grow here by worrying? No, we don't grow any taller by worrying. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Just the flowers of the field. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He knows. He knows exactly where you are at. Listen now. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We have enough things to worry about or concern ourselves with or deal with today than we do tomorrow. Okay. You know this verse, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. The kingdom of God, Mark 1, 14. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand, is here. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, if I said, ask you, how many of you are believers today? You've given your life. You've repented. You've asked Jesus, forgive me of my sins, and I'm going to get things right. I'm repenting. I'm repenting of my sins. I'm turning. It's a 180. I'm, I'm on my way to hell, and I make a 180, and I'm going to turn to heaven. So that's repentance. Repentance is a turn in direction. It's also getting rid of, of the things in our life that we need to get rid of. But even with the turn, you might say, well, do I have to be perfect before I get to, to God? No, just already with the turn. And Lord, my faith is in you now. I'm going to believe in you, Jesus, the sacrifice. I'm believing in the sacrifice. Okay? It says you will be saved. It says, but let me read again. Mark 1. 15, it says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In Mar Ma uh, Matthew 6, 30, says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Okay, so the kingdom of God, repent and believe. Yep, been there, done that. And yet I worry. I've, I've, I'm in the kingdom of God. I'm a believer. I'm a child of God. It says, seek first the kingdom of God. So if you are not in the kingdom of God, listen, you need to get saved first. You need to repent and, and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you're not in the kingdom of God. I don't care if you said a sinner's prayer. 
If you don't believe, if you're not doing the right, if you're not repenting and you're not believing the gospel, you can say the sinner's prayer every single day and not believe it. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Well, I, I don't really believe. I can say the sinner's prayer. What I'm saying is, getting in the kingdom of God is, is the one aspect of not having to worry. Seek first the kingdom of God, but here's the second part of it, and his righteousness. This is where we say, well, well what is righteousness? I'm talking about all these things shall be added to you. I'm talking about God saying, what do you want? What do you need? I'm, I'm asking, what do you need? And then we would say the things that we need that are not just all about me and myself. But there are things, yeah, we need. Lord, I, I, need, I, need, I need a greater income. One way or another, I need to have food on the table. That's the natural things. But so often it's this thing of the kingdom of God. Yep, check, got that. But his righteousness, oops, what does that mean? In Romans 14, verse 17, it says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not the physical thing, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's jump to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Seeking his righteousness, not our, not our own righteousness. What then? Are we better than they, the Jews and the Greeks? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin, the Jew and the Greek. The Greeks were the superpower, or the, sorry, the Romans were the superpower of Jesus' day and even of Paul's day. Uh, but the Greeks were the ones that the Romans looked up to. Man, they were the philosophers, they were the intellectuals, they were the, the debaters, they were the ones that knew everything. And they, So the Romans looked up, even though they were the, the empire at the time, they looked up to the Greeks. So whether you're an intellectual or whether you're religious, like the Jews, they had the law. As it is written, this is a summary, when it comes to are we better than they, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. And it's interesting. God is waiting for us to seek after him. God is available. God is available to us, and we are, we are seeking others. Perhaps we're seeking other solutions, but we don't seek God, or we say, hey, God, you know, hey, where are you? I need you. You're not showing up. Man, do I need you now? God, where are you? We continue to do our own thing. So we go another way. There are none that who seek after God. There are none who understand. They have turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. And we're saying, God, where are you? I need you. Isaiah 64 says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that the heavens would be opened up, that you would come down, help me, that the mountains might shake at your presence, move powerfully in my life. As the fire burns brushwood, you see things are being burnt up as fire causes water to boil. To make your name known to your adversaries, Lord God, take care of those that are against me. Rend the heavens, come down, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down. The mountains shook at your presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, haven't heard, nor has, have, has the eye seen any God besides you. Any other God is, is either an idol or is demonic, but none like you. Who acts, listen, who acts for the one who waits for him. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways, you are indeed angry for we have sinned. In these ways we continue and we need to be saved. There is something about righteousness and unrighteousness. Something about righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
It continues on in Isaiah 64. It says, but we are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses, the things that we do that are of righteousness, that, well, man, I'm, I've done something really good, are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us all, all away. Just so you know what iniquity is, it's the, the word avon in the, in the Hebrew, and it means perversity or depravity, iniquities. It's the perversity or depravity that we have. We haven't even committed any sin yet, and yet within us are things that are not good. Have you ever, you feel like, man, I, I, there's this tendency for me to do something that is not good. Or I have this, I, whatever it may be. For me, there's a temper. I have to watch. It's like, where's this coming from? Man, man, do I get, I, I get upset. To, to a certain extent, it's, a, it's a, a righteous anger, but I have to be careful. It really ticks me off when people are doing unrighteously, deliberately. They don't care. And I have to watch, I have to watch how I deal with those individuals. That's an iniquity, a tendency towards something. And the Lord is saying here, we all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Our iniquities, our depravity, our, our per perversity takes us away from what God wants to do. To meet with him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you and your ways. He wants to meet with us. He wants to show up for us. And our depravity, our iniquity leads us away. I'm going to continue to do these things that I know I shouldn't be doing and I don't care because there's no other way or I think there's no other way or I hang on to it because I don't want to let it go. And there is no one who calls on your name who stirs himself up to take hold of you. Verse 7. For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities, not even our transgressions, which is an act of sin, but our iniquities, the tendencies that we have. Lord, it says he, we, he was wounded for our transgressions. Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The Lord, when he suffered on the cross, he took care of our transgressions, our sins, and he took care of our iniquities, our depravity, our perversity that is innate to us at times or is even passed down from one generation to the next. And he's taking care of that. And there's no one who calls on your name who stirs himself up to take hold of you for you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. In Romans chapter 3, verse 13, it says, their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp of this snake, this poisonous snake is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are, feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We're talking about those saying, hey, the, the religious and the intellectual and us trying to be good in our own way and we can't do it and there's major things happening in our conduct. There's no fear of God. Say, Pastor Dave, come on. I want to hear, what's the solution here? Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Those that are under the law, Ten Commandments, every single one of us have broken probably every single one of the Ten Commandments. 
We've all broken them. We're not righteous. And even when we say, oh, I, I didn't know that, and now I know, even when we know, it's like, do I use the name of the Lord in vain? It's one of the, the Ten Commandments. To say Jesus Christ, not to call out to him, but because I'm upset about something? We're guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the law, in the, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Let me read again. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, by keeping the law, by trying to be a good person, no flesh shall, will be justified or made right in his sight. You can't do it. We can't do it. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. In our own efforts, we are not good enough. We cannot be good enough by keeping the law. Now, listen up. We're talking about seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added on to you. God will show up for you every single time. Listen, some of the things that we ask for, we don't get answers to. And you might be in the right place. It's because God is saying, no, I don't want you to have that because it's not good for you. Or no, I don't want you to have that because I have something even better for you. So just wait. Just wait. Sometimes we mess up. The Lord is so good. His righteousness is on us. Listen, 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 listen. I say again, listen. Don't be distracted. One of the things I prayed this morning was Jesus, in Jesus' name, every foul spirit that would want to steal from us, the word removed in Jesus' name. I want you to listen. I want you to be, I want the Lord to show up for you. Yesterday it was like, oh my goodness. I, and every single thing worked out. Even with changes to my schedule, every single thing worked out. It was like, I said, oh God. At one point I said, God, you're so good. You're so good. When the plans change and we start to freak out, I can't do it. The, my, my plans changed yesterday. Everything worked out despite. I just say, Lord, you are so good. Listen, here it is. Verse 21, Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. He's saying, listen, let me just reveal to you, you can have righteousness before God that is not is it a, it's apart from the law. It's, it has nothing to do with the law at this point. It's not negating the law or anything like that. But you, we know we can't be righteous before God by trying to keep the law. We've already broken the law. And even when we try to change, we can't. Hey, have you ever tried being a really good person? How long did it last? How long did it last? Did you get, did you get through... Did you get through the day? Did you make it through the day? I tried so hard. Your, your, uh, your New Year's resolutions, how long do they last? I don't know. Anybody still keeping their New, new Year's resolution if you did it? Or you, you decided, nah, I'm not doing New Year's re resolutions because I can't keep them anyways, right? We can't do it in our own strength. And here the Lord is saying, here, let me give you something. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So the law was all pointing. The law at the time of, of Moses, at the time of David, at the time of Solomon, all through the ages, at the time of Jesus, the law was still in place. When Jesus came and went to the cross for us and he died and he rose again, there was a shift the law was waiting and pointing to the sacrifice. That's why I say the altar is critical for God to show up. We need to recognize that daily. Every morning, 
you've heard me say this already a few times. Every morning I make a declaration. You say, Dave, did you do it today? Yes, I did. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be great to the Gentile. Right here, I'm a Gentile. I'm, I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile. You're Gentiles. Unless you're Jewish, I think everybody here is a Gentile. The name of the Lord is to be great in my life. His name is tied in. Jesus Christ and the crucified is tied in with the altar. It's tied in with the altar. That's why God showed up with Solomon because it was, he recognized the importance of the altar. That's why there was a thousand sacrifices. Why? Probably, it was not just probably, David told him. David showed him the importance of the altar because that altar was still in operation during the time of David. His kingship, as soon as he brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, the altar and the work at the altar now resumed full force. It was daily. In the morning, the, the burnt offering was given by Zadok, who means, his name means righteous. You say, well, am I, I'm not a priest. Revelations 1, 5, and 6 says otherwise. If you're a child of God, by his blood, we have been made to be kings and priests unto God. You and I are kings and priests unto God. And there is a work that is being done or should be done every day by us. Righteous kings and priests. David was a righteous king. And the priesthood was in, in full Daily, it was moving and working. Oh, boy. I have my clock there. Oh, man. I had somebody say, can you land the plane? <laughs> All right. Okay. So I'm going to be finishing a lot sooner than I thought. So I got, man, I got next week's message already prepared. Okay. <laughs> Let me say again, now, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The prophets all were pointing at Jesus Christ and him crucified. Even the righteousness of God, now listen, you might say, Dave, is that real for real? Listen to the, time, the, the number of times the word faith is used in the next few verses, all right? You count with me, just put up a finger each time you hear the word faith, because it's faith in something. Not faith in my faith. It's faith in something specific. So the righteousness of God. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. God shows up for you. Why? Because he recognizes the most powerful and beautiful thing for him. Was giving his son. So that we could have life through his son. And his sacrifice on the cross. And when we grab a hold of it. That's the most important thing to you as well. The Father is so pleased. God shows up and says, hey, I want to bless you. I want there to be blessing, not just in your life, but I want blessing to flow from you to others. There's an overflow of blessing. Hallelujah. And I'm not talking necessarily, listen, I'm not necessarily talking about money. Okay, start counting. Even the righteousness, we're, we're counting the, the times faith is, is used, all right, in the next few verses, okay? And faith in what? Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, you got, you got your fingers going? To all and on all who believe. It's for every single person, to all and on all who believe. Faith in Jesus Christ. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We can't do it by being a good person. We've all sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely. Now once again, you might say, what does that word justified mean? It means that you are put into right standing with God. You are put into right standing with God. So God looks at you and you're saying, oh man... You are in right standing with me. You're in right standing with me. Ask. 
Ask what you will. Being justified freely by his grace. We don't deserve it. Grace is unmerited favor. It's favor that we don't deserve. And God is saying, I'm giving you grace. Why? Because your faith is in Jesus Christ, my son. To all and all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single person, yes, even Mother Teresa and even the Pope. They've all sinned. We've all sinned. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. To be redeemed. We've been bought. Redemption has to do with being bought. He bought for us life if we want it. And, and fullness of life. Abundance of life. The enemy is there to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. In fact, that word propitiation has to do with the blood that was sprinkled on the mercy seat, on the, that lid. The, uh, they, they came in once a year. The high priest came in, and there was blood. There was a sacrifice. And God accepts the sacrifice. He accepted the thousand Burnt offerings that were given by Solomon, and he showed up. He accepts the sacrifice, and we say, well, what, what more can I do but just say, Jesus, you died for me. Jesus Christ and him crucified for me. I recognize it. I acknowledge it, and it's there for me. I just have to declare it and believe in who he is and what he has done for me, and the Lord God shows up for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've been bought, whom God set forth as a, this payment for us by his blood, through faith. How? Through faith. That's the second time. To demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. So our sins, our iniquities, taken care of just by faith in Jesus Christ and that propitiation that he is for us, the sacrifice that he is for us. And I just say, thank you, Lord. All I have to do is confess it and believe it. Once again, not a mantra. I'm not talking about doing a ritual. I'm talking about the reality. This morning, as I was just saying, Lord, let your name and your sacrifice be great in my life, in my body, in my soul, in my spirit. Let your will be done in my life. that you would be glorified in my life. And then I began to expand it out over Julie and my family and my brothers and their families, my mother. And I, I went to you, my brothers and my sisters, and your family, saved and unsaved. Let the name of Jesus and his sacrifice be great in your life. That his will for you would be accomplished. That he would receive all glory and honor and praise. Hallelujah. Twice through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Passed over. Some of you are sh you're so ashamed of the past, you would want nobody to know. Oh, God, forgive me. And he's saying, oh, I've forgiven you because your faith is in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice. To demonstrate he wants to show, demonstrate is to show at the present time right now his righteousness to you that he might be just in your life to do what is right in your life and the justifier, the one that was able to justify you and put you into right standing before him. So he wants to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Three times. Not once, not twice. Three times he says, let your faith be in the only one that can get you right. And you know what? As we do that, now God is saying, hey, I want to show up in your life. Daily. Daily. To seek his righteousness. We got it. We're in the kingdom of God, but we don't seek his righteousness. Let it be sought. Daily. Make it a confession daily of your faith. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can we stand? 
Well, I still have another two or three points. Can't wait to share next week. Next week, Pentecost Sunday. This the Holy Spirit showing up. I want to give to you how the Holy Spirit can show up in your life. Simple. Very simple. Today you heard, I need to seek his righteousness. Again, faith, faith, faith. Faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. Faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. Faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. And God will show up for you. Lord, I am so excited because of what you have done in my life to such an extent in the worst of times. And you showed up again and again and again. And Lord, as I would have each and every one grab a hold of this, Lord, there will be more and more and more as they don't just say, oh, I don't think so. But as they grab a hold of it, Lord, and as they declare your name, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the, of the same, the name of Jesus is to be great in our lives, and you will show up again and again. There will be testimony after testimony. This is what the Lord has done. So, Lord, I am excited, Lord, that there's going to be an expanding out of this. Lord, to everyone that would hear for what you want to do yet in these last days, it doesn't matter where we're at and what's going on around us because, Lord, you are God over all of these things. And we thank you and we praise you. I pray blessing on my dear brothers and sisters. You're an amazing, amazing God. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your tremendous love in giving your son so that we can be clothed in righteousness, his righteousness. And Lord, you are the you can make us just and you are the one that are you are just and you are the justifier of those that have faith in your son. We are right standing with you and you desire to bless your children, your sons and your daughters. And I just thank you. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your tremendous goodness to us, Lord. You are faithful and just. You are merciful and gracious. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, I pray blessing on each and every one on this wonderful Mother's Day. Let them be blessed as they leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. He is worthy. He is good. Hey guys, it's Matt. I really hope you enjoyed that sermon today. If you'd like to check out more of them, they're going to be here and here. Have a great day. God bless.